Buster Ridge, currently from uh, Calvary Chapel, Laguna Creek, has been off in Israel visiting and working in the ministry and doing those things that God has called him to do. And so while he's been gone, the opportunities have presented themselves for the church at Calvary Chapel, Laguna Creek, to bring in some pastors and some people that are there at the church to teach. And so the normal pastor, who is Pastor Rich, hasn't been teaching, but other pastors from different places have been coming in and sharing. One of those pastors from Calvary Chapel, Dayton, has come in and shared today's teaching that we're commenting on from <clears throat> Nevada, Calvary Chapel, Dayton, Dayton, Nevada, and um, it was a very good message. But what I wanted to do before getting into the message and getting into the person is to explain what we do it afterwards, because I know sometimes that gets a little confusing to people, and the tendency of most people is to be kind of fleshy about what's going on as opposed to spiritual, because after all, we do live in the flesh, don't we? Sometimes. But you see, we have opportunity to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit of God. And so where the Spirit of God is, there's peace. And I want to bring peace into this situation that maybe people don't understand why and what I do after a service. You see, I like to sit down with my wife after the service is over and talk about what did you get out of it. In other words, what did you hear? And what did you hear? And what did you hear? And what did you hear? What did you hear? You see, we all have ears to hear, but that doesn't mean we all hear the same things now, does it? So you see, we have this round table discussion that goes on after the service. I call it afterwards, not before words, because before words we have announcements. Of course, that's called a forward. You're looking forward to what's going to happen, so it's a forward, if you get my drift. But afterwards, I like to reinforce to bring into highlight, to add to, possibly, and complement that which has been presented that the Holy Spirit has inspired the pastor to share and to bring into our awareness those things that we could discuss among ourselves. For surely we have come together to prove all things, to hold fast that which is good, but also to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to put each other in remembrance. If anything, I remember Rich teaching a very good, excellent Bible study on the Book of Remembrance. It was said that those who spoke often of the Lord and called upon His name and sang about Him and talked about Him, a Book of Remembrance was opened up in heaven and God recorded their names. And it was like, wow, what an awesome thing, isn't it, to be recorded for having listened to and now discussing those things of God? And I know that when I used to attend Big Calvary, that's what I used to do, was that I would get together with people in an afterglow. We used to call it an afterglow because, you know, we used to glow, and afterwards we were still glowing. So we wanted to talk more. We wanted to share more, do more, and be more. Now I know that, you know, nowadays you kind of got like, you know, the traditional way in most Calvary chapels, and I've been around to a few Calvary chapel ministries, is, you know, the pastor has to kind of make himself available so that, you know, people that need to be ministered can be ministered to. I mean, don't get me wrong, if they've never met the person, they want to visit and spend time with them. I kind of like always stay away because I figure they need to touch base with who they need to touch base with. And when I was in starting a Calvary Chapel and helping start Calvary Chapels, a couple of them, that um, I would make sure that, you know, the pastor had that opportunity to be available you know, and take care of all the other issues that were going on so that he could be ministering to the people. Because after all, that's what people want to do. They want to talk to the pastor. So having that availability for them, you know, I like to leave that open to them as the Spirit leads them, you know, and as the person does. But for me, it's kind of like, hey, I'll catch you in heaven, you know, or I'll talk to you in the millennium, you know, but, you know, or catch me on the side. But normally the routine is that most Calvary pastors don't get the chance to, you know, visit with just everyday folk like you and me, or maybe me, maybe you need him, so you go up and talk to him. But for someone like me, I don't really get a chance to visit that often, you know, with most of the people that I may have met at some point in time or I would like to meet or get a chance to visit with. Well, if you watch and see, you can see that usually there's a line or there's a lineup. And I just, you know, kind of like give deference to those that need the pastor because while I enjoy the message, 
I'll pray a blessing on them and let it go and just go on. But most Calvary pastors, you know, they have their things that they need to do with those that, you know, they need to minister to. And then they have to go to lunch, you know, because they got to eat too, you know. I mean, after all, you need to feed, you know. <laughs> you don't muzzle the ox, so to speak. But, you know, there's an old tradition that used to run off to the Calvary. It's like a big Calvary used to run down to the coffee shop. And you see all the people from church there, and they'd all be visiting, whatever. Until Romaine told us and warned us about not tipping the waitress. Oh, forgot that, you know. But anyways, the point being is this. Afterwards, sometimes was more the word than what was in the word. I mean, after all, isn't it God by way of the Holy Spirit teaching us? And using a man's personality and his particular insights is what is a blessing to have a pastor for. But you see, the pastor gives us the word and we need to water it. We need to, you know, kind of like make sure the soil is prepped. We need to make sure that we follow up on it lest the seed be stolen and somehow someone comes along and snatches it away or steals our joy or somehow comes in and, you know, stomps on the seed before it has a chance to take root. So the ministry of afterwards as part of Vitigo is that with which afterwards we want to make sure that you put it in your heart and keep it in your heart and remember those things to put you in remembrance of those things that, like Paul said, I have taught you, or God has inspired you with. So that's what we do in afterwards, and that's why we're here in this words, looking to and explaining that with which we had heard, that which we've seen, and that which we've handled with our own hands. You know, the four of us, and me. And by way of uh, saying that, I mean, I only share and relate those things that I have seen, participated in, and gone through. And so, enjoying Pastor Gary from Calvary Chapel, Dayton. I think that's the name of it, yeah. You know, the, you know, nowadays I don't know if they're a Calvary Chapel or if they're just called by something else like Applegate Christian Fellowship or Harvest or, you know, whatever. When I went to Calvary Riverside, it was Calvary Riverside, you know. <laughs> Changed its name eventually. But my point is this. I enjoy, and when I enjoy, I try to highlight that and make sure that, you know, we get and we glean and we gnaw on the bone, you know, get all the juice, you know, <laughs> suck it up, you know, that with which God has given us. And it was so good this time that the humor that with which Pastor Gary began the message was about those people. And you know who those people are, you know, and he used the church and the steeple, you know, and all the people. You remember that? Yeah, you heard, so did I. You know, that here's the church, here's the people, you know, and he kind of like, you know, pointed out and made reference to working cooperatively, you know, interactive type of church. And I thought, hey, what a great time to launch afterwards, because We've been doing afterwards with my wife and I, but we haven't made it part of you and I in Vidivo's ministry yet. So with Gary mentioning after with Gary mentioning interactive, I said, That's Vidivo. Hello. So the Lord inspired me to go ahead and go, Oh well, here we go. Let's discuss afterwards what the word was and what we got blessed with. So I really enjoyed this message. I gotta tell you straight up that, you know. When it came to pastors, you know, I I heard his message, you know, and I mean, I've heard lots of pastors and lots of messages, and I was, you know, and I, you know now in video that I'll be honest, you know, I'll say, hey, you know what, that was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know. but you know, Lord led them, Lord leading them, and Lord teaching them, you know, or I'll say, wow, it was awesome, you got to go, man, this is like, you know, like the golden era of Christianity, or like, whoa, that was great for theologians, but you know, somehow I don't think all the people are ready for that, you know, or whatever it may be, because I won't lie to you, you know, I mean, I, you know. Much as we are one body with one heart, one soul, one mind, one strength, and we have one faith, one baptism, and one you know crucifixion, and Jesus died and rose again, you know, and that we're all saved, you know, and we all have different ministrations by way of the same Spirit, that the Spirit moves and operates according to His will and not our will, and that whatsoever it is that the Spirit decides to do within you and within me, it causes our ears to hear and our eyes to see according to His will and not our own. That means we can all be different in some ways, and in a lot of ways we're still all the same because we have. Jesus, to put it bluntly. And we have one commandment. And really, it covers all the commandments. And it's basically love. It's, hey, you don't get around it, you don't get out of it, you don't get through it, you don't get to get away without it. Love. Because really, you're told to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that really covers your enemies too, because your neighbor is your enemies and all those other things. And Jesus said, hey, I got some news for you. You blew it already, but guess what? Since you didn't even get that down, i got to make it worse on you. You can't love because you need the Holy Spirit in order to love because I'm telling you, you got to love from the inside out. And your insides suck. At least that's what I get out of it. And so Jesus said that, hey, 
this is the kind of love with which you will know and you will be filled with that that's why I'm leaving to send you the Holy Spirit so that that way you can love with the kind of love that God's love is. And I like people saying it's unconditional love and using that one word definition for agape or agape. And yeah, it's sort of unconditional. It's sort of not, but sort of is for the most part. You know, with the way that we explain it, you know, it's like, well, yeah, there's no real conditions. It's been freely given to you, but in a way, if you don't love and you don't forgive, you're not loving. And it's like, that's a condition. So what's the condition of your love? Well, you can tell that it's not agapeo by way of what it is or isn't. So there's some conditions, but that's more like characteristics of it. But we won't go there. Because what Gary said was unconditional love. And I, I kind of agree. You know, I mean, I agree. It's the best way of us explaining agapeo in a way that we can't refer to it to in the Hebrew, which would be a different way of saying it, but it would still be the agapeo, but it would be the way of manifestation of that with which we call from everlasting to everlasting, from ages to ages, or his mercy endures forever, or let Israel all say his mercy endures forever. And that's what one of the expressions of what agapeo is, or the aspect of that with which God manifests himself in the characteristic of what he is, is through the statement in the Hebrew idiom of the expression that we say, his mercy endures forever. Whoa! But that's because it's looking from a different perspective than the Greeks were. And Paul was using the Greek language at the time that we're talking about agapeo. And so it's kind of like, yeah, okay, you know, and then when Jesus was using the Greek, you know, and they were trying to refer to a Greek Jewish way of understanding because Greeks do, Jews do speak Greek, you know, and that they were very intelligent and traveled throughout the world, and that they had most cross cultural experiences just like we do today. <sighs> okay. But you can find some people that love like that. And the best way we call it is unconditional. Now, I, you know, I kind of grimace at that unconditional part because it's like, well, if you stay in the condition you're in, it ain't unconditional because you're going to hell. <laughs> but God's love changes you and rearranges you and makes you and he works in you and changes you and creates in you that personality of what God is like. So with God in you, you are saved and God has saved you and God redeems you and God atones for you. And Pastor Gary brought out in a very simple way kind of the neat thing about you're called and how that way of calling upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved, that I brought up in video before, but that, you know, you shall be saved. And it's like you've been called to, you know, come to church. You know, you've been called, you've been brought there, you know, and he used a very good analogy there. And if you really want to hear a good way about calling, you should listen to the tape that Pastor Gary said, because it was really good. I mean, it was cool. You're calling. And then he was talking about chosen and sanctification and, you know, your election, you know, and it was like, this is very good about how he explained it. You know, there was that pragmatic way. It kind of lost some people in some ways because it got pregnant for a minute and not just humorous. But people got it. You know, I could tell, you know, that they were pretty much catching it, you know. And it's kind of like the point of it coordinated together with beautiful in its presentation of saying, hey, you're here for a reason, to put it bluntly. I mean, people don't like to use Rick Warren purpose-driven because sometimes people have problems with Rick. Well, sorry, Rick's okay. You know, you get to know him, you'll know. But you have, uh, there's a reason why you exist. There's a reason why you are, and as Gary said, particularly at that moment, there's a reason why you're in church today. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coinkadink. You're not here by circumstance. You're here because you were chosen to be here. You know, God, it's no accident you're here. You're here on purpose. There was a purpose for you to be here, and God put you here on purpose, and you are meant to be here. This is where you're meant to be. You know, and I agree. You know, and then the people that are using technology and are sitting at home are meant to be there too, you know. But that's okay. Because he made the point and he was trying to bring out the aspect that you can't just sit on your feet, you know, or sit on your hands and you can't just say that you're not part of the body or that this is bad and that is good and picking out people, you know, kind of like arguing or arguing this way or that way or up way or wrong way and that way. You know, he brought out the whole idea that, hey, you know, you can't just be, you know, a sore thumb, you know, in the hand of God. You know, you can't just sit there and act like, you know, you're the only one. Because guess what? This is the way with which you will know if you are his disciples indeed. And he brought out the idea that by the love you have for one another. Now, I'll admit, adding an afterward thought about it, that's how I got saved. And that's what I told my wife. I didn't get saved by some eloquent speech that Great Glory gave. <laughs> Or some great Bible teaching that great glory was, you know, anointed and given. Dare I say, uh, uh-uh. 
he was talking about Jonah, and it was like Jonah and the whale, you know, and he was drawing some really caricature with, you know, kind of hair sticking out, and, you know, kind of like bulged eyes. The message wasn't all that impressive. I'm sorry, Greg. You know, God bless you, you know, but it was like, oh, it was okay. The worship was pretty cool. You know I mean? It was kind of like Sweet Comfort Band, you know, in the day, so you know what I mean. But no, I mean, I was a hippie, so, you know, I was like, yeah, the message was good, you know, but, you know, and I wasn't raised in church, so I could say, you know, it was, you know, it was good. But wow, the thing that impressed me about everyone there was they glowed. They had the love that we talk about. The agape love, the love that was so obvious that it was more than apparent that these people had spent time with God, in God, and were filled with the Holy Spirit. They glowed, and there was no doubt about it. No, they they glowed. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, after I got saved, I glowed. Woohoo! You know, my wife told me one time when I went to a church to speak. You know, and I said, you know, we've been married. Oh, I don't know, probably three or four years or something. I'm not sure how many years. She can tell you the story better than I can. Because yeah, I always mess up these stories sometimes when it's her, what she has seen and what she has heard and what she's examined, not what I've seen. But I remember her telling me that, you know, um, I went to this one church and uh, I had been working in the ministry, you know, and I'd been doing lots of stuff behind the scenes, you know. And, and I wasn't in a overt way in the ministry like Vidivo. I wasn't teaching at that time. I was working behind the scenes. I was the you could say the janitor, <laughs> you know, just speaking of rich. I was the guy who did everything that nobody else would do and nobody else could do and nobody else would volunteer to do so that I would wind up being doing it so that way the pastor was free to do what he was supposed to do so everything else I did. You know, and that was in uh, Dunnigan, you know, Christian Fellowship that we started up there, you know, as a missionary outreach. But, you know, if there was no one around, no one to do it, I did it, you know. When somebody needed to volunteer to stay at the church overnight for a week because the sound system was there and we didn't have locks or keys or security or anything else, hey, I stayed in the church, lived in the church, stayed in the church, protected the building, you know, and the sound systems, you know, or when we needed to, you know, open up and do other things like, you know, fix the furnace, I was the one that underground, you know, doing that. Well, about that time while I was in the middle of doing all the stuff that I enjoy doing, being behind the scenes, God said, or God inspired some guy that was visiting to ask me, of all people, you know, because he had talked to me a few times, and we had talked about the Lord, and he called up his pastor, and he talked to him, and then he talked to me, and he says, you know, I'd like you to come and talk to our church, you know, he says, you could talk about anything, you know, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, just, you know, I talked to my pastor, and, you know, they'd like you to come, and I was getting ready, and I was under the church at the time, you know, in the, the dirt, you know, all grimy and gritty, and the way I normally am, you know, and I was, you know, had, happened to have a cell phone, I don't like cell phones, I don't normally have phones, but anyways, I was looking at the cell phone, I was getting ready to say, no, I went, no, only it didn't come out. So I went, yeah, and I went, and I said, you know, I was trying to say no, but it came out okay. So I guess that's what the Lord was, and that was it. And I went there to the church and shared, you know, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of miracles, <laughs> and if you want to know the full story, you have to ask my wife, because, yeah, you know, she there were some miracles that happened that night. I was like, go ask her if you don't believe me because I'm the one testifying about what I saw. So, you know, ask her what she saw. Blew her mind. So, for me, it was like, eh, that's God in action. Who cares? <laughs> God does those things. You know, you get, kind of get used to it. But the interesting thing was that as soon as I started sharing in the pulpit or sharing with the people in front of them and in the pulpit, I glowed. And she sat there thoroughly shocked. She'd never seen that. And no offense, everyone can glow once you let God out and you let the Holy Spirit in. What can I say? That's the way it works. So, anyways, Gary, Pastor Gary, was teaching today, and we enjoyed it. I mean, it was so thrilling to hear the message just roll out smoothly to share with and take care of. And I know, you know, he had his outline, he had his notes, you know, he went through his presentation, you know, but at the same time, it was good and wonderful to hear those things as he brought out the love of God and the manifestation that with which the love of God would be made in our hearts, that we all would be loving one another. But then we would all be a part of the body of Christ. Then as he built upon the body of Christ, he also built upon your 
purpose in the body of Christ, which is to do and to be something. You know, if you're sitting on your hand, Romanians used to say it a different way. We won't say it that way. But, you know, if you're just not doing anything at all, you should be doing something about it. You know, I mean, you should be a part of the body of Christ and recognize your gift. And if you don't, then someone should be coming alongside you to help you to find not your gift per se, and you didn't use that, but you're part of how you fit in because when one of us suffer, we all suffer. Now, the part of being one suffering and, you know, we all suffer, you know, let's touch, touch base on it and then kind of move on. But, you know, the reality is there are people that in a lot of churches at times are left on the outside. They never are approached by anyone. Or if they are, they're kind of, it's, it's a token thing. Hi, how are you? My name's George. You know, glad to meet you. Hi, George. How are you? You know, you go on, you know, not real. But how real you are. You know, I kind of got real out of Calvary Laguna right off the bat with a guy named Joe. Joe found out about me because he asked me about my job. I went, and I really didn't have an answer for him that he would have accepted at the time. So I just said, well, I've been disabled <laughs> at times in my life. I got an incurable disease. You know, what do you want to know? <laughs> I'm not, so I just kind of, you know, I was stumbling all over it, you know, and I don't know what he got out of it. But anyways, we kind of got to know each other a little bit through that experience, you know, and he didn't ask me about my job, but you know, that's one of the things that I always hate about sometimes when people are trying to get to know you. Sometimes they don't really want to get to know you. They want to know about you. They don't want to know you. They want to know about you. And most men, the way they want to know about you is, hey, what's your job? Because, of course, your job is what defines you. Well, sort of. <laughs> you see... I can say on the one hand, when I talk to Joe, that I was disabled. On the other hand, guess what? I just got off working jobs as a boiler maker out in 110 degree weather, up next to welders, you know, out in the sunlight, you know, hauling, you know, 200 pound, 300 pound things that, you know, were like outrageously heavy that, you know, someone in my condition should not even been trying to lift, much less able to lift. And it was miraculous, you know, and I was working, you know, 12s, 10 12s, you know, and things like that, you know, that were like, you know, they were paying me like buku bucks, you know, to do these things, you know, and outrageous amounts of money, you know, and they promoted me, you know, and I became a safety coordinator, you know, I was like, are you kidding me? You know, God? Foolish things in the world? Confound the wise? How do I get to this? Journeyman Boilermaker. Huh. I ain't been to college. Well, I'll sort of. I went for network engineer. But my point is this. On the one hand, God using inability. On the other hand, God using ability. And that's what God did with Pastor Gary, in showing forth God's purpose for you to have been in the church this time hearing the Word of God. God has a purpose for you. He has a design. He, as opposed to you, will make you into what you need to be. Because I have been that. You see, everywhere I have gone and any place I have sat down and rested my hat, so to speak, I have been made into able to do whatever work it was that was set before me to do. That with which came into my hands, as Rich Pastor Rich said one time, whatever you got in your hands, use. Hey, I've been able to use everything that was put in my hands, and I have succeeded in the same way that the scripture says that he does everything well. It doesn't say he does everything expert, but does everything well. And the blessing is upon us if we would just yield ourselves to God to be that part of the body of Christ that God has intended us to be, to be really his son. Because we all in the church are the body of Christ. And I like going to church in order to practice religion and to practice my religion and to practice my faith and to grow in faith. But there comes a time where you're alone, one-on-one, -on -one, in the reality of knowing God, doing what God wants you to do. And once you do, you'll find that God may send you somewhere, like he does with me, to do those things that you see other people having already done. As a missionary at large, that was one of the things that I've always recognized that, you know, if I needed to be a pastor to someone else, a pastor. If I needed to be an assistant, I was an assistant. If I needed to be a janitor, I was a janitor. If I needed to clean toilets, I cleaned toilets. If I needed to work out in the fields in the hot blazing sun, I worked out in the fields in the hot blazing sun. I mean, even a Latino worker isn't going to tell me what it's like to pick crops because guess what? Hey, I know how to pick crops. I was out there. I did potato fields. Hello? I was on the sorter. I even picked them. Yeah, I know what it's like, you know, to get no money, because I used that money at that time to go to Israel. One-way ticket, 500 bucks, pew, miles out of there. Praise the Lord, you know, that once I was in Israel, I got a job. <laughs> wow, I just starved to death. Not really, because in Israel, nobody starves. Trust me, nobody starves. It's a mandate of Jews to feed the poor. Nobody starves. 
might get a little hungry, but you don't starve. But my point of it all being is that God can use you, as Gary said. God wants to use you, as Gary said. God has put you where you are because even as Gary was teaching, that's what you are in the body of Christ. You may say you're a toe that's not knowing what you are, or you may say you're a finger not knowing what you are, but God really can equip you and make you into anything he wants you to be, to use for his purposes and design. So if you want to step up to the plate and take an at-bath, I would suggest that you listen to Gary's message and learn from being a part of the body of Christ in the message that he shared because it was very succinct. In other words, it was very appropriate. It was like, on the mark. It was right on. He was like, dude, you got it. And he was funny. A lot funnier than I am. <laughs> he was spot on, as we used to say. We'll leave Spot out of this. Sorry, Spot. He really had something to bark about. It was one of those kind of tail wagging messages. But honestly, when I post this and I put the comments, I'll give you the link for the message so that you can hear that. But for now, if you find this video and for some reason this afterwards isn't connected to the actual message, then you could probably go to Calvary Chapel, Laguna Creek and find the message that was given on July 7th. Is that what today is? July 7th, 2013. And listen to the Sunday morning service that Pastor Gary from Calvary Chapel, Dayton gave. And that's what this afterwards is connected to, so that you get the words. Because really, we're kind of like breaking the ice on this particular message. And I wanted to hurry up and get it started, because it kind of fit with what Gary said about interactive, you know, and I'm kind of like, it was kind of neat. And I didn't get a chance to really compliment him and bless him and say, awesome, dude, right on, cool, you know, you got it, hey, let's, let's talk, you know. Hey, my daddy, you know, we got it together, you know, we're going with you, you know. <laughs> no, but chill, chilling, you know with him, you know, it would have been cool, but guess what? You know, we all got work to do, you know, and sometimes you got to clean up the sanctuary, sometimes you got to move on, sometimes you got other things that you have to do, like I had to do. And so, while I miss him already, because he had such a good message, I went and checked him out on YouTube, and so I would recommend Pastor Gary One on YouTube, and he's only got a few messages, you know, that are like short messages, because at one time Calvary, or Calvary, at one time... YouTube only has short messages. I don't know if he's doing that on purpose or if he can do longer, but he's got like five or ten minute messages, and I would recommend to go and listen to them. He's a little more serious on them. <laughs> kind of like when you see me at, um, say, at Calvary Chapel Laguna Creek, I may not be quite as animated there, you know, as I am here, because there I have to kind of like, you know, kind of tone it down some so people can increase and I can decrease, you know, so if they can do their part, you know, and I can kind of like, you know, back away and let them do what they're supposed to do because, yeah, I've you know, done that, been there, done that too, you know, well, done that too, I was like, okay, because I remember doing it by myself, sometimes a lot of those things, because I was the only one there that was willing to volunteer. We got it done. So, let me encourage you and exhort you, if I can, in the message that was given. God loves you. God will use you if you want to be used, but God will love you to the point where you'll want to minister and serve one another in love. Because as you serve other people, you will feel the love towards that person. You will bind yourself to that person. You will discover, as Gary said, you know, the church and the steeple and all the peoples, and it won't be those guys or them guys or them or us or we, but it will be one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. You will know, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity because you will have the love of God manifested in your life and in your heart so much so 
that the word isn't really as important as you will be obvious by the glow you have on your face for the love that the people know and are attracted to by seeing how much you love the brethren and the brethren love you. For if you want to be loved, you have to love. If you want to receive love, you have to get it from God. If you want to know love, you have to understand it's God's love. Some people call it agape, other people say agape. Some people call it a different word in Hebrew. It's a long story. But you know, you have to receive that. Here. Yeah, you know, numero uno. You've got to get it first. You've got to have God love you. Because really, i got news for you. No matter how much you think you love, like burgers and hot dogs and Harleys and choppers and all the other things that people say they love, you don't know love at all until God loves you. And God demonstrated his love to his son. And by way of his son dying for you and being risen from the dead, he proved his love for you in that while you were yet a sinner, Jesus died for you. And so Jesus has offered to you the perfect example of love a free gift from God to save you from an eternal destiny of hell and damnation to an acceptance and realization of God bringing you to himself in heaven. To be loved today by the everla everlasting, ever-loving arms of God Almighty by his Spirit. For you to feel and know and have faith in that kind of love that God would have already proven it was love, but also will be willing to show you that by the demonstration of it in those people around you that have experienced the same mercy, the same grace, the same kindness, the same gentleness, the same peace, the same joy, the same love that brought them to know what God's love is all about. And that is his agape for you. And that's what Bar Pastor Gary shared and was a perfect example of. God's love for you, God's love in you, God's love to you, and God's love motivating you to use that with which is inside to come outside to serve one another in love. By this shall you know that ye are my disciples indeed, in that you have love for one another. And so thank you, Pastor Gary, for this afterward and inspiring me to share words that come after what you have taught us to use and to apply to our lives in the greatness and the glory of God our Father who has demonstrated his love and who has given us Jesus and Jesus has sent and asked the Father to send to us his Holy Spirit so that we would know that love that you talked about. We would experience that love that you have prayed for us we would go forth with the love that will be demonstrated to the world as light unto it. The love for one another. God bless you, Gary, and thank you for being a pastor.